Please join me in welcoming Debbie to the stage. Thank you. Thank you. Hello, everybody. Delighted to be here. It's been a fascinating three days of all these brilliant minds and brilliant ideas. As Steve said, I lead the uh, La Fondation d'Associes System. You have to, I'm a French major, so it works out well. Um, I lead the La Fondation d'Associes System in the United States. The foundation is a global organization with three arms, one in Europe, one here, and one in India. Our mission is the same worldwide. We provide support and funding to, um, to innovative projects in uh, science and education and cultural heritage that leverage 3D technology and vi virtual universes. Since our, found, since our founding in 2015, we have funded over 220 such, such, um, such projects, and those are in 11 different countries. Our grantees range from K to 12 programs that are designed to inspire interest in STEM for the next generation to advance in very, very sophisticated scientific research at very advanced and sophisticated academic institutions. We were very, very pleased to receive an application from Massachusetts Eye and Ear, Harvard Medical School, to, um, to create a, virtu a living eye virtual twin. And uh, everything that it, about this project meshes perfectly with the mission of La Fondation. So it is my intense pleasure to announce to you that indeed the La Fondation has approved a grant to Mass Ioneer to embark on this new project of designing and accelerating the interest and design of a living eye uh, human twin, right? <laughs> virtual twins, or living eye virtual twin. Um, and I am very delighted to invite Dr. Joseph Rizzo, who is the lead on this project up to the stage, to share his vision. Get it? And I'm, sure, <laughs> I'm sure you get that a lot. Thank you very much, Thank Dr. Thank you so much. Look forward to Thank working you. with you. Okay. Thank you very much, Debbie. I am so honored. Our team, Elahe and uh, Joe Baldwin, who's here, and uh, the others with whom we have been spending time together are really delighted because we have clearly laid a foundation of mutual interest. It's clear that there are mutual areas of expertise that will blend together well, uh, but now we're really gonna be able to take off, so I'm deeply appreciative. I'd like to explain what it is uh, that we're trying to do, and uh, I'll start by just giving you a little background on myself, which is that Originally, I trained as a neurologist, always interested in vision, then trained as an ophthalmologist, became board certified in both ophthalmology and neurology, then combined those two to become a neuro-ophthalmologist. I've been at Harvard throughout my training as a neuro-ophthalmologist and have been director of the neuro-ophthalmology neuro service at Harvard for maybe 16 or 18 years now. So my, my background clinically is in vision, my interest clinically is in trying to diagnose causes of blindness, but my commitment in research has been to try to restore vision to patients who go blind. I began and co-founded a retinal implant project uh, to develop microelectronic implantable devices, either for the retina or part of the brain. That's one part of what I do. But uh, biological solutions are also uh, becoming increasingly available. Before we talk about therapies or potential therapies, uh, let's talk a little bit about this particular talk. And it has to do with the form of blindness due to injury to the optic nerve. The optic nerve is a cable that connects the eye to the brain. So the visual part of the brain is in the back. Your eyes take the pictures. There are these huge pathways that bring your information flow back and forth. The optic nerve on each side contains about 1.2 million connections called axons. It's only about a millimeter and a half wide. That structure just behind the eye is susceptible to two major forms of blindness, the most common being glaucoma, which affects 1% of the general population. And the second most common is like a stroke of the optic nerve. It goes by a long name, non-arteritic, anterior, ischemic, optic neuropathy. We abbreviated with the term NION. Those are the two conditions that we're talking about today 
And we're focused on those because certainly for nion, it's pretty conclusive that the problem is with blood flow through small blood vessels. And there's really substantial evidence that glaucoma is also a disease that suffers from poor blood flow. But no one knows the mechanism of either. So to uh, just uh, get us focused in the right place, maybe if you look at the screen to your left, here are the eyes in the front, the visual part of the brain is in the back. These diseases occur just behind the eyeball, just beneath what we call the optic nerve head. So in the first five or six millimeters of the optic nerve, these two blinding diseases occur. So if the issue is about blood vessels, that sounds pretty mundane. I mean, sh surely we know about the blood vessels of the human body. The father of modern anatomy, Vesalius, back in the 1500s, began to look at these blood vessels. And I made this montage across the centuries to show that by the early 20th century, Labor in Germany made uh, this wonderful color image. Um, and you can see how dense the blood vessels are just behind the optic nerve. So here we're looking, the eye would be up. This is the back of the eye. This is the beginning of the optic nerve going toward the brain. And this is the area of interest. This area, which is filled with small blood vessels, is supplied by blood vessels that move along the length of the optic nerve. They come from the large carotid artery in the neck. Ultimately, smaller and smaller branches are made. But some run right along the length of the optic nerve, and they give branches into the optic nerve head. And here you can see under higher power, this from Zinn, his collaborator was Haller. There's an important structure called the circle of Zinn Haller that I'll talk about later. But here you can see he made this woodblock print. He was an, he was an artist as well as an anatomist. And uh, here are the blood vessels that we're talking about, and this is the optic nerve head. So let's look at it in a different projection. So here's the back of the eye again. Here's the optic nerve going to the eye, uh, to the brain. On your left, you can see the large carotid artery. It's just coming up into the head. The rest of it's going to go up to the brain. But it gives off this ophthalmic artery, which then gives off many branches, including these that go right along the optic nerve. If we move to the right, you can see one such branch going right along the optic nerve. And then when it gets to the optic nerve head, it gives off all these branches. And typically, most humans have one on the inside and one on the outside of these special vessels called ciliary, posterior ciliary blood vessels. So I'm trying to focus our interest here. And this is just another rendition <clears throat> to make the point uh, that this is the black box. This is the area where it might seem obvious that we would know the blood vessels of the human optic nerve, but we don't. And there's an interesting story about how that can be possible. We don't have time to talk about it, but again, just to show you the vulnerability of this zone, Len Devine, who was our fellow many years ago, has been chairman of ophthalmology in Montreal for a decade and a half, uh, looked at a patient who had a stroke of the optic nerve and there are fewer than five examples in the history of medicine of this. This is very special. This is the beginning of the optic nerve. This is the optic nerve going down to the brain. In this dark area, this is the same patient, different levels of sections. The dark area is where the stroke occurred. Again, right at the optic nerve head. Remember where all those red blood vessels were? So isn't that odd? The area with all the blood vessels is the area that became, that had a stroke. So using a technique called scanning laser microscopy, I didn't make these pictures, scanning laser microscopy, we're looking at the back of the eye. Now in this case, the eye is down, so we're looking at the back wall of the eye, and these are all blood vessels. So the back of the eye is the most vascular tissue in the human body. And look at this, here comes the optic nerve. It's heading toward the brain. On the side, you see these larger vessels that I have been pointing out to you. These are the ones that come along the optic nerve and give branches that then create this incredible network of blood vessels. Again, intuitively, you might look at that and say, well, surely that's the area that will be protected against any blood loss, right? And looked in another way, here's the optic nerve again. And now what I'm showing you is that around the optic nerve, there's a circle an anastomotic circle 
the circle of Zen Haller. Well, why is that there? Well, through evolution, one could surmise that for whatever reason, despite all these blood vessels being here, added protection was needed to this zone. This is a very unusual structure. And it turns out that some humans have a complete optic nerve uh, circle and many don't. So that's the vulnerability. And here are and the contribution that I'm going to be making uh, to this project is that we have sections of human uh, eye sockets, basically. I have 2,500 sections from one patient, 500 from the other eye. When you make a section, here's the optic nerve surrounded by its covering called the meninges. And you can see there are all sorts of blood vessels running along the length of the optic nerve. But no one has developed a nice 3D volumetric display of these blood vessels. Our hypothesis is that when these blood vessels riding along the optic nerve get to the back of the eye, where it's subject to eye motion over the decades, that there's an age-related biomechanical effect that in some way impairs flow through these small blood vessels. No one has studied this. Just yesterday, one of my wonderful students, MD, PhD from Harvard, showed me this stunning image. These are the blood vessels of a mouse eye intact. Scientists have developed a special way of so-called clearing. Look at these blood vessels. That's the intact eye of a mouse. I was stunned by this yesterday. As well as I know this field, I didn't know this technique, and I brought it here uh, to show you today. This is what we want to do, basically, to the human eye. No one has done that. Now, this will only be beneficial by combining it with biomechanical analyses. Elahe Javadi is doing that work, will be doing that work with us, paired up with uh, Joe Baldwin as uh, giving us guidance and uh, wisdom. Um, and before I uh, turn it over to Elahi, I just want to say no treatment is available for these diseases that prevents visual loss. There are drops for glaucoma that reduce eye pressure, for sure, a multi-billion dollar industry. But it's a handle on the problem, but it isn't the problem for most patients anyway. So um, Joe Deemer at, at UCLA has done finite element analyses, studying the mechanics of the back of the eye, a really wonderful picture. He, too, has focused on the back of the eye. But he's looking at the mechanical properties of the soft tissues, not the blood vessels that we intend to work on. And again, an evolutionary bit of evidence that we're onto something important. This is the back of a monkey eye. The green stain is collagen, the same thing that makes the sclera or the white part of the eye. It's that dense tissue. So the optic nerve is right here in the middle. And that optic nerve is surrounded by a dense collagen ring. So not only is there a ring of blood vessels, the circle of Zinhaler, but a ring of collagen. That tells you there's some mechanical vulnerability that evolution has tried to repair. So before we go uh, to Elihi coming up, I just want to say that I want to really give credit to Phil, B Phil Bouchard. I gave a talk three and a half years ago at a meeting. He came up and introduced himself, told me about your company. He said, is it possible we can explore things? I didn't follow through. I gave another talk at the same meeting a year and a half ago. Phil came up to me and said, hey, do you remember me? I said, sure, I remember you. We talked. But this time, it made sense. And I followed through, and he followed through. And we're here together because of Phil. And I've been blessed to work with uh, Joe uh, regularly, uh, at least once a week, and Alahe, of course, and Steve, who's overseen the project uh, from the get-go. And together, we formed the team that has uh, you know, benefited from this wonderful grant. But now I'd like to invite Alahi up to uh, explain the engineering behind what we're going to be doing. I don't know. Hello, everyone. This is Elahe Javadi. I'm a modeling and simulation industry process consultant at Dassault. Um, it's not a long time that I joined Dassault, but um, it has been a great experience for me. Um, so um, hearing about these um, different projects we have at Dassault, especially experiences we have in um, you know, visual twin experiences for uh, in, li in life science and healthcare. Uh, the examples are here, like living lung, living brain, 
living hard and living food and uh, food or need, something that you heard a lot during the past couple of days. Um, all these exciting projects uh, are trying to help in the process of precise uh, diagnosis and also um, efficient treatment uh, for you know patients with um, patients and also it provides patient specific treatment um, that actually helps in the process. Um, so uh, we were thinking why not uh, we start something about living um, eye project. But before that, uh, the established method for virtual twin um, experiences is uh, usually consists of three main steps. At the first step, um, we gather the MRI data from um, an organ, uh, which one, uh, from an organ. Uh, here we can see, for example, this is about heart. We, um, based on the real patient data, we create a 3D model of that organ. Here it is, um, for example, for um, these valves. And then uh, after creating the 3D model of that organ, we um, uh, based on the, also the, some clinical data like uh, the heartbeat and also uh, if it includes um, blood uh, flow, we, we have the flow data like um, hematocrit or different um, uh, parameters and then uh, import them to the simulation, the uh, simulation analysis and also run a simulation to see how uh, it functions. And based on that, uh, the physician can make a decision about uh, how should the treatment be. Um, this is the main uh, steps of doing a virtual um, twin. Um, so what are the potential benefits of using um, a virtual twin for eye? Uh, the main one would be um, because as Dr. Rizzo said, there is no uh, specific um, treatment for eye diseases. So it's better, it's gonna help a lot in the process of uh, understanding the, um, you know, uh, the reason for eye disease, the causes, and also, um, um, and also it's gonna uh, provide a patient-specific treatment for um, patient with um, bl uh, blindness. And also um, it, it, it could generally improve the treatment innovation. Um, so talking about what are the main, uh, what could be the potential causes for um, blindness, um, you can see here the, um, the main reason that uh, patients are diagnosed with uh, are um, the main reason could be a transient disruption in the circulation of the optic nerve. Um, it, it goes back to the blood circulation in the back of the eye. There are some diseases that usually correlate with that like hypoperfusion, uh, thrombosis, all these um, diseases that I uh, mentioned here. Usually, um, you know, they have something in common. They are about uh, blood flow circulation in the back of the eye, as Dr. Rizzo said. So um, we thought that maybe um, doing a, only a structural analysis that includes the all elements of eye um, doesn't, it's not enough. We need to also include um, blood circulation and uh, have something, uh, a kind of uh, multi-physics simulation that uh, ha helps in the process of uh, diagnosis the reason uh, for this uh, disease. Um, this is the workflow that we considered uh, for uh, creating the virtual twin of eye. The first stage would, the first step would be uh, getting the MRI uh, data from uh, patients with blindness. Um, and then creating a structural modeling, um, um, a structural model, which uh, I'm gonna, uh, in the next slide, tell you more about the details of the, you know, the elements of the, this uh, model. And then the next step would be uh, adding the blood arteries in the back of the eye, uh, which, um, which, uh, which is the most important part, because as Dr. Rizzo said, you could see the dense uh, network of blood arteries in the back of the eye, modeling, uh, you know, we should be very careful uh, which arteries we should segment and include in the simulation. Uh, what are the inputs to the simulation? Is it because um, it seems that uh, usually clotting, blood clotting is one of the reasons that may cause this um, blindness and also strikes in the back of the eye. Uh, so they are correlated, uh, correlated with um, micro uh, structural, uh, structural um, you know, properties of the blood, like, um, for example, uh, adhesion of red blood cells together, um, um, clot, blood clotting, and we need to consider all those steps. And I think something that I can add to these uh, projects, and maybe the main reason uh, I'm included in this project is helping with this part, because during my PhD studies, I. 
uh, I had a ch chance to um, you know, look at the rheology of the blood in very small scale, in micro scale, to see how it behaves uh, in um, you know, small arteries. Because for example, as you know, blood is very complex, uh, complex um, fluid. Uh, when, when it comes to large arteries like aorta or we, when we are talking about uh, virtual twin of uh, hearts, it is very easy to just consider blood as a Newtonian fluid with a constant viscosity. But it, when it, uh, when it uh, goes into small arteries, um, the rheological properties of blood get more complex. We, ha we are dealing with a very um, you know, complex uh, behavior that it, uh, it is related to the, uh, you know, the, the formability of red blood cells and also adhesion of red blood cells together when, it, when they are in a small shear rate, especially in small uh, arteries in the back of the eye. So uh, this is gonna be challenging a little bit, but we are thinking about how we can actually uh, pre um, or precisely model um, blood flow in, in this system. And then the next step would be calibrating the model with the patient data to see how accurate it is. And uh, based on that, we are going to, um, if, you know, um, help in the process of treatment. If it's a drug delivery, we are gonna uh, help the virtual twin to see how we can actually help in the process of treatment. Or if it needs a surgery, we are gonna do it virtually and then um, tell the surgeon or, um, you know, advise him how this treatment process should be. Um, I told you that we are at the very first stages of this process. Uh, only the structural modeling has been performed so far. Um, this is the uh, initial model that we have developed. It uh, includes um, the eyeball and also the optic nerve on the back, on the back and also six different um, muscles, four um, recti muscles called superior, lateral, medial, and uh, inferior, sorry, uh, inferior, yeah, rectus, and two oblique muscles, superior and inferior. <laughs> All these six muscles are helping the eyeball to move in different directions. Uh, in the next video, I'm gonna show you how, um, so this is a demo that starts from the um, you know, skull, narrows down to, um, go, um, you know, to the eyeball and how we can actually see the motion of the eyeball towards the central body, which is called adduction. Um, as I said, this is just a structural analysis. At the next step, we are going to uh, do the segmentation of blood arteries, add it to this to have a, like a multi-physics simulation and then um, see um, how we can actually um, diagnose what's the reason for blindness. Is it related to um, the pressure on the back of the eye? Does this, because everyone has a, you know, has a specific configuration of um, blood, uh, you know, these artery, uh, blood arteries on the back of the eye. So you wanna see, is it related to the pressure? To, because when eye moves, the optic nerve and these networks of arteries are actually um, are stretched sometimes because of their special configuration, some pressure is applied to them. We wanna see what, what is the main reason or is it blood clotting? So, um, so as I said, it's gonna again help in the process of diagnostic treatment and we're gonna help um, to transport the education tra training and collaboration in this process. Um, this is it. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, you did great. Yeah. yeah, I would be happy to answer any questions. <laughs> great. Thank, thank you both. Thank you. Um, please come on up. So uh, we do have a minute or so if anybody has any questions. I know it's a little bit early in the project, but you have you know, the vision for um, really pursuing the uh, cure for blindness uh, in our generation. So any questions on where they're going, where they're at, suggestions? Yeah, hi. Uh, hello. Hi. Hi. Dr. Reza. Um, thank you for uh, talking about this topic. Uh, it, is, uh, it is obviously a very important topic and also personally glaucoma has, is important to me, but I want to understand that is intraocular pressure what my naive understanding is that the intraocular pressure plays a role in the disruption of the optic nerve, but what you said today is about the blood vessels, which is eye-opening. So is that being considered, and 
where does the field stand on that hypothesis of intraocular pressure versus what you're mentioning about the microvessels impacting the optic nerve? Thank you. <clears throat> That's a deep question. Let me give you a general answer. I'd be happy to go into the specifics with you. You know, in any field, paradigms develop. And paradigms often begin to develop when you have some understanding or some scientific tool that gives you information that you can begin to work with. So in glaucoma, <clears throat> the ability to measure intraocular pressure, you know, was achieved, uh, you know, probably in the, in the late uh, 19th century even. So we knew that some people with glaucoma had higher than normal pressures. And the field then moved in that direction <clears throat> to develop surgical methods initially and then ultimately drugs to lower the pressure. There are many reasons why that was thought to be beneficial. beneficial. I'll say that glaucoma is a general term for what probably is many subsets of disease. So for instance, there is a form of glaucoma called low tension glaucoma, right? I mean, normal pressure glaucoma, even though glaucoma is normally high pressure. So there's a group of diseases under this term of glaucoma. And in the 50s and 60s, it be, you know, people began to understand that if you're trying to get blood into the optic nerve, that there's a force it has to work against, which is the pressure in the eye. So it had been understood that if you lower the pressure in the eye, you may be presumably improving the perfusion pressure of the optic nerve. So that seemed like a good thing. And then over a period of decades, I would say non-mainstream researchers began to publish evidence that blood flow was a primary cause of glaucoma. It's debated. The commercial industry surely has moved toward pressure control because that's a set of tools that they have control over, but it may not be the primary issue. And that's where the field is. I think it's, it's a bit caught in the middle. Uh, I think everyone would agree that if there's anything you could do to improve the perfusion pressure of the eye, that's gonna be a good thing. How best to do it isn't clear, and in our case, um, you know, there's good reason to believe that blood vessel vulnerability, mechanical, age-related vulnerability is contributing to the problem. So on the one hand, nion is like a stroke, a sudden loss of vision, but a conceptualization of glaucoma, at least for some forms of glaucoma, is that it may be a slow dwindling process where there's reduced blood flow, but only minimally, so that the damage occurs over years or decades. That's a debate. I'll be happy to talk to you more about it later. <laughs> Great. Dr. Rizzo, it's so good to see you Good here, to see you too. <laughs> to know that we were able as a team to pull together oh, all well. this great technology and all your wisdom to, and the research to try to solve it. Uh, all problem. thanks to you. I'm so glad you came up to me the second time. <laughs> <laughs> so one of the things we've talked about a little bit is the heart and cardiac as one of the leading causes of death in, in our society or in the world. And I'm wondering how big of a problem these vision impairment diseases are yep. in terms of the population. I mean, this is, is it as big as, and, and although it's not maybe a catastrophic, if, well, actually it's not true. If you lose your vision, yeah. it's not as bad as dying, but it's almost as bad. <laughs> yes. How, how many people suffer from these diseases and how big is the population we're trying to help here? Well, 1% of the general population has the, the common form of glaucoma, right? So 340 million or so, 350 million citizens in the United States alone, 1% is, is a ton of people. Just that one condition alone. So there are millions mm. and millions and millions of people who are affected. We didn't say this, but Elahi uh, introduced the fact that there are, there are various mechanisms of blood flow limitation in the body. You talked about thromboses and clots and things like this. We have a suspicion. We didn't say it directly because we don't know but <clears throat> most of the strokes in the brain are small vessel strokes. And um, if we are able to uncover an age-related consequence on blood vessels in the eye, it wouldn't surprise me if it proved to be relevant for the brain and the kidney, the two other areas of the body that have very, very high blood flow through very small blood vessels. Time for one, maybe one more. Joe Baldwin here. Uh, not so much a question as uh, a plea for um, 
uh, throwing out the net of, of ideas and resources on this. Obviously, we're very early in this project. It's really been a um, tremendous uh, gift to me to be part of this team. And uh, I do want to say that, as you just said, Joe, the um, connection between uh, small blood vessel problems in the brain and in the kidney um, does lead us to suspect that the modeling that we're going to have to do at the, at the small arterial level is going to be very important. But what we are planning to do at first is, is understand the interplay between the eye movement and the vessels that feed those small micro vessels. And now we can start to, because we have a, a, a parametric model, we can change blood flow, we can change pressures, we can change um, the uh, pliability of the surrounding tissue. But you can see where we're going with this. So those that are working, um, anybody here in the room or online that are working on the kidney model, um, if you have uh, some thoughts that you might want to share with us, we're all ears. And that's the plea. Yep. Can I say one more thing about LA, if I could? Just yes, please. Um, <laughs> Elahe didn't say this, but uh, an area of expertise that Elahe has is in non Newtonian blood flow. You mentioned that yeah. blood you know, fluid is very, very complex. But once you get to very, very small blood vessels, the dynamics change incredibly. And most of the people who study blood flow do not employ non Newtonian computational models. And you have that expertise, and we will be able to employ it. So it's, it's a huge advantage. Great. Well, I hate to cut it off. I have a ton of questions myself, but uh, please, once again, uh, join me. In. Yeah, thank, thank you. you. Thank you, Steve. Yeah. Thanks so much. Thank you. Thank you up there. <laughs> yes. Thank you very much.